Grace and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church in Ogden, for those of you who are watching from afar. Uh, welcome, everybody. If you are in the sanctuary here, you see these little clipboards. There should be some in your pews. If you would mind, go ahead and fill it in whatever information you'd like to leave with us. If you want to get in touch with the church or with me, if you would like to receive any communication, email is probably the best way to find out what's going on in the life of the church. You can put it here, and then you'll find out about what's happening uh, week to week. So uh, th there is that. And then in your worship guide, you can see uh, there is this little insert here about our scholarship program that we have at the church. So you can take a look. And then after the centerfold, there's a lot of centerfold. That feels weird to say in church. <laughs> after the center crease. <laughs> Should we start over? <laughs> uh, <laughs> You can see some announcements on what's going on in the life of the church. Oh, I'll be here all week. Don't worry. Um, so, so you can go ahead and peruse through that, but I just want to lift up a couple of things. One, right after worship today, we're going to be having a membership class. If you're interested in becoming a member of the church, we will be meeting. So through the narthex, right across the next set of double doors, there's a big fellowship area with a bunch of round tables. You're welcome to come right over right after worship. And we're going to have uh, lunch prepared there for you. And we're going to be talking about uh, the journey of faith. And then we're going to do the same thing next week as well. And so this week is really more about who you are and your journey. The next week is going to be about who the church is and how we can walk with you on that journey. So you're welcome to come on over. And again, there's a lunch with it. Uh, the adult education class, I think it's the, you guys met last week while I was gone. Yeah, great. OK, keep going. Rock and roll. Uh, the music program, the adult choir, the, the vocal ensemble, is going to be meeting this Wednesday at 6 o'clock, as is that adult education, the head to heart, meeting at 6 o'clock as well. Uh, are you guys meeting in Geneva Hall as well, Glenn? You, are you meeting in Geneva Hall over here as well? Yeah, okay, just wanted to make sure. And the ensemble is going to be meeting in here. Wonderful. Uh, the kids are going to be doing some music right after worship today. Yep, okay. Uh, okay, Breaking Bread is a meal fellowship program that we're, we're starting to get back up. I think this is the last week to sign up for this round of it. If you'd like to do a, a meal group, a small group to get to know some other folks in the church, go ahead, there's RSVP information in, in there. Our outreach program co combined up with uh, our local synagogue, Barit Shalom, and we're gonna be hosting here at the church a, a Seder meal. And if you'd like to participate, you can RSVP to Mary. It's happening this Saturday, right, Mary? Right, and reservations by Wednesday. Reservations by Wednesday, thank you. So I've already signed up. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, really cool opportunity. And then the last thing is uh, the mission team is putting together a scarf bomb. I don't know what to call that. We're just doing a scarf bomb. And I saw the, the service last week, and where's Tina? I don't know where Tina is, but she laid down, oh, there you are, Tina, thank you. You laid down the gauntlet, and I'm ready to pick up my needles, okay? I'm gonna need a lot of help. I'm gonna be your remedial student on scarf knitting, knitting of scarves, but I'll do one. I'll do at least one, okay. All right, with that, let's take a moment now. Um, and for those of you who are new to the congregation, welcome. And we always start our time of worship with a little bit of centering, a little bit of a holy pause. And this practice comes from some of the monastic tradition of the larger church. And in this, in this tradition, they call it statio. And what statio is, is it's um, setting aside what came before and taking a moment to just breathe and give yourself the opportunity to recognize we're moving into something different here. And so in your mind, you can imagine the monks would be out working in the field and that bell would ring, calling them to their time of prayer. And they would set down whatever it is they were doing and they would gather together at the door of the sanctuary and they would have this moment of statio to prepare themselves to enter into worship. 
So if you will with me, go ahead and close your eyes. And take a couple of slow, deep breaths. And together, we prepare ourselves to be encountered by the Holy. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome all. Um, as noted in the worship guide, if there's an asterisk, please stand if you're able, or if it's in bold, please say in unison. The bread of life opens our eyes. The word of life opens our ears. The risen one shows us God's own brokenness, and by those wounds we are healed. me in the prayer to confession. The one who calls us to repent hears us in trust that our creator knows us through and through. Let us open our hearts to the healing of God's forgiveness. Let us make our confession to God. Good and gracious God, we are creatures of dust, misunderstanding of your life, death, and resurrection among us, needing forgiveness.
And now let's take a few moments to make our own prayers of confession in the quiet of our hearts. Friends, the psalmist reminds us that as far as the east is from the west, so far has the Lord removed our transgressions from us. Therefore, know that in Jesus, the salvation, the healing of God has visited upon you. Thanks be to God. And let's lift our voices and sing of the glory of our forgiving Lord. Elise and Beverly to go ahead and meet the ushers in the back. Living out God's call. God has given us all that we have and all that we are. Let us give back to God a first fruit of what we have received. Lord God, we offer to you only a portion of what you have given us. All that we have. Let us rise as we sing the doxology together.
Please be seated. Today's psalm is Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Sorry, I don't think I was working. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths. For his name's sake, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Thank you, Jenny. I'm doing it one more time. That doesn't hurt anybody. I'll invite the young people of the congregation if you want to come on up. And I'm going to have you come right up into the, into the chancel area here and come around the communion table. Come on up, guys and girls. So yeah, we can gather around. We can gather around the table here. You can come around the back here. It's OK. You can come around the back. Uh, so today, we're going to be talking about the Passover. Now, there, this is like a really, really important part of the story of our faith. And this is part of the Old Testament story of our faith. But Jesus picks up on this story in particular, and when he was at the table, and when he shared that Last Supper with his friends, with his disciples, he was practicing the Passover story. He was telling that story. So in Exodus, where we are as a congregation, you know, as we're going to be looking at today, there is a special meal that the Hebrew people who were slaves in Egypt, they had right before they were released, while they were let go, where Pharaoh said, get out of here, I don't want to see you people anymore. And the reason why it was a special meal is because they had to eat it on the run. They had to eat it fast, and they couldn't even save leftovers. Do you guys like leftovers? You have to be careful what questions you ask. Yeah. yeah. No? Oh, I like leftovers, okay? Depends on, what leftovers. Depends on what leftovers. There you go. Okay. So this meal got told every year afterwards. And they were there it's called a Passover Seder. And that was the meal that Jesus was at with, with his last disciples when he said, This is my body, this bread is my body given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant of my blood given up for you. It was a Passover Seder. And we're actually going to get to share in a, a Passover Seder with our Jewish brothers and sisters this Saturday. Over in the, in the CE building, they're going to do their Passover Seder over there. And folks from the congregation, if they are SVP to Mary by Wednesday, um, they can join in and and go through that with a Jewish congregation to see how they do that. But when they do that, there's a part where the youngest person in the room asks some questions. Kinsley, how old are you? Seven? Eight? Eight. <coughs> Greta, you're seven. So Greta would ask some questions. And, and the question she would ask is, why are we eating this bread that doesn't have any yeast in it? That's not leaven. Why do we eat these bitter herbs? Why do we drink this wine? Why do we pour some of the wine out? She would ask questions, and um, they're prescriptive, right? They, that she, re, the, the youngest person would ask the same questions every year. And the reason for that is, because we all need to be told the story over and over again. 
And the children need to learn this story. And do you know what this story is all about? The Passover story is about how God saves us. That's the core of it. How God sets us free. How God lets us out of jail. How God releases us from the things that are holding us down. Now, uh, right now, in your lives, there probably are some things that you feel like you're in prison over. Like sometimes if you get your screen time taken away, or you don't get to have all the desserts you want, it feels like a prison, right? Yes. <laughs> school! Oh my goodness, school! Why did I not think of that one? But as you get older, you'll realize that different things in your life start to feel like they have you in bondage, like you're in prison. And that is the core of the story of God, is that he wants to let us go. He wants to release us. He wants to free us to live a full life. And when we celebrate this meal, which you all do once a month with us, right? We've started doing this every week. But on the first Sunday of the month, you all participate in this meal with us. It's kind of remembering that and celebrating that God sets us free. That's the core of the story. God wants us to have real life, full life. And we're all learning what that life looks like. And you know what? See all the people out there? They too are learning every week what that life looks like to have full life. Okay, so that's in a nutshell the Passover story. So before we go to our Sunday school, let's have a prayer together. Our hands we fold, our heads we bow as we talk to God just now. Lord, we thank you that you have given us this meal so that we can remember over and over again, so we can tell the story, so that we can be reminded that you have created us for life and abundant life, not to live in slavery, and that you, Lord, have come to set us free in Jesus. And so I ask, Father, that you would give this knowledge that you would embed deeply in these young men and women's hearts, that story, so that they would know that they have been set free, free to live and to love, to live in your light and to love you as we love one another. And we pray all of this together in Jesus' name and all God's children said, amen. amen. Thank you, boys and girls. It's fun, trust me. I don't know why they would trust me. I'm never over there. <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord, you remind us that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word stands forever. And so... Lord, we know that we don't live on bread alone, but we live on the very word of yours. The living word, Jesus. God in the flesh, Emmanuel. God who said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that I desire that you have life, life abundant. And so, Lord, as we remind ourselves and hear the story once again of your liberation, your freeing, your exodus. May we embody it. May we internalize it. May we live it out for the sake of your kingdom. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, first of all, before we get going, I just want to say uh, yesterday, over here in uh, the parking lot, we had a little celebration for Gro Ogden, which uh, has taken over that, that plot of land uh, that was kind of unused. It's all fenced in over here on the north end of the, of the property and are turning it into an urban garden, uh, an urban farm, really. 
And we had a, a couple, our, our state representative and some city council members that were coming and speaking and talking about this beautiful partnership. And I, got to, I was blessed to give the invocation for it. And uh, I saw a bunch of folks that were there from the church. So thank you for being there and helping to celebrate and support this really cool partnership in ministry that we're doing for the sake of our neighborhood and community. This is part of how we're living into our vision. So I just wanted to say thank you um, and lift that up. Okay, so now, thanks to Chris. Chris uh, preached for me last week. She covered the pulpit and led us through the first nine signs, plagues, in the story of Exodus. Uh, we're continuing our journey through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch. And we've all gone all the way through Genesis, and we found ourselves in slavery in Egypt with the Hebrew people, and then Moses gets called, and he and his brother Aaron go to Pharaoh and say, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our ancestors, demand that you let the people go. And Moses, or Pharaoh said, yeah, over my dead body, which will come back to bite him, and we'll see that today. It won't be his dead body, but it'll be many others. And so we find ourselves today with the institution of the Passover and that 10th plague, the death of the firstborn. And I just want to lift up, like, there is a moral tension here that we see from the historical distance that we have and the cultural distance that we have, right? We don't have anything against Egyptians the way that maybe the early Hebrew people did. Okay, so I think, I think that the Exodus story is really written as Israel's, I mean, this is one of the formative foundational stories of the people of Abraham, of God's people. And I think it's kind of like their epic. It is their big story. And this is really normal for how history was recorded in the ancient Near East, that this story, this epic that gets written down, what we know of as the Exodus, it, it's kind of, it's like, if it was a movie, it's like based on, you know, factual information or based on a true story, right? It's rooted and it's grounded in history, but there's some artistic license that's allowed for interpretation and how the story is told. It means that some of the details were maybe changed or added by the storyteller in order to heighten the tension or maybe simplify a really complex reality or just to make a point. Okay, so I think that's part of what's going on here. That, and that, again, that's really normal for ancient storytelling. And I want to point out a couple of things about Exodus as a whole over the big picture, and then we'll, we'll drill down into the 10th plague in particular. One is that this story of liberation, this story of redeeming, right? Re the word redeem, we use that, that language in, in the church a lot. It means to buy out of slavery, right? So if you had a family member who was in slavery, you paid the price to take them out and to free them. That is what to redeem actually means. This story is not just about the redemption of Israel. And this picks up on a major theme in Genesis. Remember, Abraham was blessed and his family was blessed so that he can be a blessing for the sake of the whole world, not just for him and his family. The ultimate purposes of God's activity and liberating work in the world are not just so that Israel would be blessed and Israel would be free, and it's for the whole world to be blessed and to be free. Over here, Miss Karen. Yeah, she's over here. Right? We just needed mom. Sometimes we all need mom. Yeah. Now, in the ancient Jewish world, there is a tie between the moral order and the physical order. Okay, there's a tie between the human uh, ordering of the world, and the ordering of creation. So when human society is at its best, when it is most just, when it is most true, when things are working the way that they're supposed to, there's a harmony in creation, right? This is kind of the Jewish worldview. But when the opposite is true, when there is an injustice, when there is brokenness, when there is defection and estrangement within human society, 
then there is the same. There's this chaos which exists in creation. And so in a way, what we're seeing, just like in the creation story, God orders that was in chaos, brings it into right order. Here, when we see Pharaoh in his injustice and his falsehood and his pride and his brokenness, it's like creation is starting to return back to chaos because of that injustice which is happening in the social world. And then the last thing I want to lift up is that the real question that's going on throughout all of these plagues, the the ones that Chris talked about last week, is who's the real God? Is it Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Or is it Pharaoh and all of the gods of Egypt that he represents? And so the, the plagues are kind of like this big showdown between Pharaoh and the Egyptian gods and Yahweh. And you can really see this because uh, a lot of these plagues represent Yahweh's uh, dominance or superiority over other Egyptian gods. So, for example, Egyptian life revolved around the Nile River. Okay, like they need, it's a desert. We're familiar with that, right? So water is super important. And the Nile is one of the great rivers of the world, certainly of North Africa. Well, in Egyptian mythology, there is a god of the Nile River called Hapi. And the first plague is turning the waters of the Nile into blood. So that which was supposed to give life can no longer sustain it. Right? This is the god of Israel's superiority over Hapi, the the Egyptian god of the Nile. The second plague is the the frogs. Well, there's an Egyptian goddess called Hecate who is portrayed as a frog. The plague of the death of cattle. There's an Egyptian goddess called Hathor who is portrayed as a cow. The the ninth plague, the one right before we get where we get to today is the blotting out of the sun. Okay, the Egyptian high god, right? Like the the king over all of the gods in the Egyptian world. You probably know this, Ra. Ra, the sun god. And as a matter of fact, the the pharaoh who, best guess, was the pharaoh during this time, uh, Ramses, uh, Ra, Messes, means son of Ra. That's what his name actually meant. And so the blotting out of the sun is like Yahweh's superiority and victory over Ra, the sun god. And so all of these plagues are theological statements that the gods of Egypt and Pharaoh were no gods at all. So now we want to get into this 10th plague here. And I want to talk about the power of remembering. And as a matter of fact, uh, our communion table doesn't have it written on it, but a lot of times you'll see on the frontispiece here of a communion table, it'll say, do this in remembrance of me. Remembering. Because that's part of what God's people are called to do, to remember. And that's why God's people, Israel, are called every year to remember the events of the Passover. They're actually given a whole bunch of festivals that happen every year to remember the things that happened. And over and over again, in the, in the biblical narrative, in the Old Testament in particular, God says, remember, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of your fathers. Remember, I'm the God who rescued you out of slavery in Egypt. Remember. And it makes me feel better when I'm like, remember to pick up your jacket and put it away. Remember to take your plate and put it in the dishwasher. Because I feel like God with the Israelites. Remember, remember, remember. And when we read through this story, like if you go through and read Exodus 11, 12, and 13, you're going you're gonna to realize that God is telling the people to remember this thing before it actually even happens, which is really interesting, isn't it? Before the Passover event even happens, he's saying, remember what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you how to remember it. It's this emphasis on in the future, this is going to be a big deal. And that's one of those really interesting things, right? We often don't know that in the moment when we're going through something that it's actually really important. It's, it's usually only in retrospect. It's only after the fact that you look back and you get to say like, oh, wow. Like, life is now different 
because of that thing that happened. And in the moment, you don't realize it. God is saying to them in the moment, pay attention here. Because this is a big deal. And it's important because any people, any society, is formed and held together by their rituals, by the things that we do over and over again, which speak to a deeper truth that we want to proclaim and that truth that we want to remember. Rituals, exhibit A, rituals are something that we do, actions that form us, that speak to how we think and who we actually are. And one of the most striking features about the rituals that are outlined in the 10th plague in this Passover story is how the story is going to be told. Remember, I just shared that with the kids a couple of times. It, it actually says in this part of Exodus, when your children ask you, why do we do this? Okay, um, your kids are going to ask you, why do we do this? Have you ever, right, in, in this season of Passover in the Jewish community, they don't eat leavened bread. They eat matzah. Have you ever had matzah? Yeah, it's gross. Yeah, it, it's like flavorless cardboard. Your kid's going to be asking them, why are we doing this? Why do we have to eat this awful stuff? But they're also asking other questions, right? Why are we slaughtering the Passover lamb? Why do we put the blood of that lamb on our doorposts and our lintel. You go on further, why, why do we consecrate the firstborn of everything? And this, the text here, the scriptures say, you're going to respond when your children ask you this. It's because of what the Lord has done for me and what the Lord has done for us, not what the Lord did for our people a really long time ago. Okay, do you see what, what's just happening there? what the Lord has done for me and for us. It's taking something that happened in the past and bringing it into the present. What has God done for us? What has God done for you? That's why we do the things we do. That's why we remember. And there's, a, there's a, an Old Testament scholar uh, who's my favorite Walter. His name is Walter Brueggemann. I don't know all that many Walters, to be honest with you. But uh, Walter Brueggemann says that the biblical community of faith is a community of memory. And our remembering is to try to form an identity in the midst of a culture that's committed to amnesia. Our culture wants to forget the past. Our culture in particular I'm, I'm talking about 21st century American culture because we're always looking at the next thing. We want to forget the past. And if you have grandkids, maybe you felt that. Because we're the, really like the first generation in human history that cares more about the future than it does the past, which is really dangerous and scary territory to be in. And so when we gather and we remember, when we do this in remembrance of him, we are trying to form ourselves in an identity. We're not just doing something out of piety or engaging in a history letter, uh, a lesson. We're trying to form ourselves. Who are we as a people? We are a people who have been rescued. We have been set free. That's, that's what we're doing when we're remembering this. Okay, so I want to jump into the Exodus story here. And if you notice, we didn't read any of the scriptures from Exodus. I want to read them to you in line now. So um, starting in Exodus 12, I'm going to kind of walk through some of this. So the Lord says to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month will mark for you the beginning of months. It'll be the first month of the year. This event is so stinking important that the whole calendar is reset based on this. Okay, this Passover event means everything starts fresh. He goes on to say, tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, you take a lamb for each family, for each household. 
If your household's too small, join with your closest neighbor, you get a lamb and divide it in proportion to the number of people who will eat it and your lamb will be without blemish. A year old male, whether cheap or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, which means that you had a couple of days to get really close and cuddly with this one year old lamb and the kids have already named it. And then the whole assembly of Israel gathers and slaughters it. They do this at twilight. And they'll take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat it. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, human and animal, and on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment for I am Yahweh, the Lord. So there's this connection that's being made with the firstborn. God rescues Israel, whom he calls my firstborn son. Right? That, that happens in Exodus. He says, you are my firstborn son. And he does this by taking the Egyptians' firstborn sons. And then there's that line, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. Notice, this isn't a sign for God. It's not like he's looking for directions. It's like, okay, which house? Which house? No, no, no not that one, because that one has the blood. Um, it's a sign for you, the people. It's a sign for them. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And then uh, it goes on to talk about the institution of this Passover celebration, where God says, every year, you're going to celebrate this meal. And you're going to retell, you're going to reenact this story so that you will never forget that you were once slaves in Egypt, and by the power of my hand, I liberated you. I rescued you. I set you free. And I want you to note something here. I think this is a really important, it's between the lines kind of thing, that if you're not careful, it's really, really easy to miss. There is no moral test. There is no doctrinal test to whether you are allowed to participate in this meal. You do not have to be worthy to share in this meal of God's liberation. That's not the point. You are invited to participate and let it redefine your identity. Who you are as set free by God. Exodus 12 goes on to say, At midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn even of the livestock. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all of his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud cry in Egypt. If you look at the cover of your worship guide, you can see uh, a rendition of Pharaoh holding the firstborn. And there was a loud cry in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. And the honest response to this is, it was a tragic event. We are talking about the death of innocent children due to Pharaoh's hardness. Okay, so here's that moral tension that I was talking about. The Hebrew people, they celebrate and rejoice. They throw a party. They sing and they dance when Pharaoh's army is cast into the sea. They do not celebrate and dance and throw a party at the death of these innocent children. They don't rejoice here. And neither do we. This is a tragic event. And during the modern Passover meals, there is a number of cups of wine that are uh, part of the Seder meal. And when each of the ten plagues are read, parts of the wine, drips of it, are, are spilled out to represent some of the joy and some of the life and the precious blood that is spilled during the plagues. And then during the tenth plague, during the that when they talk about the death of the firstborn, they do a double portion. 
of spilling out of the wine to recognize that this was and continues to be a tragic event. And honestly, there's a sad mirror to reality here, to our world. You all know this. Children's lives are often taken prematurely because of what the adults around them and their hardness of heart have done, particularly those in power. And so we continue to mourn and grieve that as well. So we go on in the Exodus story. Pharaoh then summons Moses and Aaron. All of the houses in Egypt are grieving and mourning. And he summons them that night and he says, get the heck away from us. You and your people, go. Go worship Yahweh as you said. Take your flocks, take your herds, do everything. Just be gone. And so the people took the dough before it was leavened. With the kneading bowls wrapped up in their cloaks, and then they put it on their shoulders, and the Israelites, they took uh, done as Moses had told them, and they asked the Egyptians on their way out, they asked them for their jewelry, for their gold and their silver and their clothing, and the Lord gave people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked for, and so they plundered Egypt. So they leave Egypt, not as slaves running under the cover of darkness, but as conquerors with their bounty. And this is a theme that we're going to see here next week as well. They don't have to take it by force. It's given to them. They leave dressed for battle, but they never actually fight. And actually, the next verses say that a mixed crowd, it's not just Hebrews who leave with them. There are people from Egypt who go with them too. Because God's liberation isn't just for the chosen people, it's actually for everybody. And I want to point out a couple things about this traveling light here. Right? They take the dough before it's leavened. It's an important reminder that when Israel gets into the luxurious promised land flowing with milk and honey, present tense well-being, being comfortable, living off the fat of the land, makes us forgetful about the hardships of the past. And so Israel remembers, they're given these festivals and these meals so that they can keep in touch with their roots, where they came from. So they, it would evoke gratitude, not their own self-congratulation. Look how great we are. And another lesson for us here about this leaving in a haste is that sometimes the price of freedom, of liberation, of removing the bonds and the shackles of slavery is leaving behind what was near and dear to us when we were in bondage. So if you or people in your life have ever wrestled with addiction, you know what this means. Freedom means you got to let go of the bottle. you got to let go of the drugs. you got to let go of the thing, whatever the thing is, that was holding you in slavery. Otherwise, it's just a new kind of slavery. And so uh, then we have the event told in Exodus 13. God tells Moses to consecrate all the firstborn, human or animal, because they belong to the Lord. It says, when God, the Lord Yahweh, has brought you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your ancestors and has given it to you, right? So when that time comes, this won't be for 40 years, I'll remind you. You're going to set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your livestock that are males shall be the Lord's. The firstborn of the donkey you can redeem with a sheep, and if you don't redeem it, uh, you have to kill it. But every firstborn male among your children will be redeemed. Redeemed, remember? Paid for out of slavery. The firstborn here is linked to the coming of the promised land. And this is because in an agricultural economy, which is the world that they lived in, when you live on somebody else's land, you know what you do? When you pay rent, you pay it in kind. Here's the first of my fruits. Here, here's the first barley or, or wheat or corn. Here's the first soybeans. Here's the first of my livestock. It goes to you, to the landlord. Because God is the one who's the landlord. We're just the tenants on it. 
And then uh, it continues on, when in the future your child asks you, what does this mean? You'll answer, by the strength of the hand of the Lord, he brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from human firstborn to the animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord every male that first opens the womb. But every firstborn of my sons I will redeem. I'll purchase out of slavery. This is where the child's role come, comes in here, right? They're not actually shielded from the pain. They're not shielded from the tragedy. And this is interesting, right? Because I've got kids. I've got little ones. And it, the, the child psychologists actually say it's good to let your kids be exposed, like a funeral. It's good to bring them to a funeral. Don't try to hide that from them. As a matter of fact, reading children's literature, it's good for them to experience loss. That's why Charlotte's Web is probably one of the greatest children's books of the last hundred years. And I remember when I was reading this with my girls uh, over the last year or two, maybe it was two years ago, they could feel what was coming. They knew what was starting to happen with Charlotte, and they didn't want it to happen but they also wanted to keep going. It's kind of lear helping them learn and understand that this is part of life. And the child wonders why we do these things. The question that we hope our children are asking us today is, Mom, Dad, why, why, do, you, why do you, when the plates come around, why do you put money in there? Well, when we are at Walmart and we're coming out and you see the guy there, why do you... Say nice things to him. Why do you help him out? Why do you volunteer your time doing the things that you do when you don't have to? Why are you doing these things? And the answer that we're supposed to respond to is because God did for me. Because of Jesus. Not for what Jesus did for those people then, but what for he's done for me, for us, here today. Right? Because for Christians, God's central saving act for all humanity is right there. It's the death and the resurrection. And so it's no accident that this meal that we do here, this central thing, like this is the thing that Christians have been doing forever always, since there was a church. They've been sharing in this meal. It was a Passover Seder. And Jesus reinterpreted it. This is how you're going to be set free. This is how you're going to be liberated. This is how you're going to get to have full, abundant life, is look what I'm doing for you. I'm setting you free from all that holds you. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. And our children need to know the story as well. The early Christians saw the Passover as the foreshadowing of the work that God would ultimately do to redeem the world through Jesus. And there's a connection between Jesus and that Passover lamb, right? John's gospel says that Jesus was crucified on the time the Passover lambs were being prepared. Our children need to hear, to learn, to internalize the story that we are redeemed by the work of God and Jesus at a terribly high price. So let's keep telling that story. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we come before you today giving you thanks as always. Thanks for what you have done for us, for the terribly high price that you have paid, for our freedom and our liberation. Lord, help our identities to be solidified and formed in that work that you've done. Help us to remember, today and every day, that you are the God who sets free. You are the God of Exodus. Liberate us today, Lord, for the abundant life that you have in store. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to join me in our great prayer of thanksgiving as printed in your worship guide. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
right everywhere and always to give our thanks and praise to you, Lord, for you breathe life into us through the power of your breath, your spirit, your wind, which blows where it will. Lord, we're not in control, but we seek your control over our lives. We seek your freedom, your liberation. And as the landlord, as our redeemer, we give back to you what you have given first to us. We put ourselves at your service and your mercy. And Lord, for the places where we turn our back on that redemption, where we ignore it, where we choose otherwise, you don't let us go. You come after us as the good shepherd goes after the one lost sheep. And therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the heavenly choirs and all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy Spirit, we ask that you be here and that you bless this bread and the fruit of the vine, this meal that we eat and this cup that we drink, that it be a heavenly banquet, a foretaste of that which is to come. May it remind us today of our liberation, of our redeeming. For we know that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And so with confidence and hope in the future, we pray the prayer together that Jesus taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. It's given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, he gave thanks to his Father in heaven, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul reminds us when we eat and we drink, we proclaim the saving death and resurrection until he comes again. And friends, just like I said today, this meal, there is no worthiness at stake here. This meal is for those who desire to be liberated by Jesus. Allow this meal to form and transform who you are. All are welcome here. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Would our communion servers please come forward. The ushers will come forward and invite each pew to receive. I have a gluten-free option here, and if you have mobility challenges, please stay where you are, and I will come and serve you in your seat. Friends, the table is set. Come, remember and feast.
would you join me for a moment of prayer? Lord, having been fed at your table, having been fed by your word, may we together as your people remember. May we, in a culture committed to amnesia about the past, be formed by your mighty deeds, by your great works, by the way that you have liberated and set us free. May we always remember, Lord, where our freedom comes from. It's not been by the strength of our hand, but by you. We may be dressed for battle, but we don't have to do the fighting. We need to but stand and watch as our Redeemer does his work as our Redeemer lives. And so, Lord, we lift up <clears throat> those who we carry in our hearts, those who weigh heavy upon us. We lift up our friends and our family. We pray for a group of students that's traveling to Pittsburgh during this week. We pray for our family members who are struggling with illness. We pray especially for peace in this world, in our country, for those suffering in pain, and for those who find themselves in positions of power and in leadership. May they seek out justice and truth. May they seek to protect the innocent in the children in our midst rather than to cast them aside. Lord, may you continue to work in our life. May we see your hand, your liberating and redeeming hand at work. And we pray it all in the name of Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. Let's rise. And we sing our closing song, Lamb of God. At the beginning of the Gospels, John the Baptist is baptizing, hence the name John the Baptist. And he sees Jesus walking up and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what he was referring to, the Passover Lamb that Jesus would become. So let's sing Lamb of God.
as we together say our mission. Our mission is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and to honor God's will. We participate in God's healing of the world by encouraging discipleship, living love, kindling hope, inspiring beauty, and championing justice in our neighborhood, our local community, and the greater world through prayer, worship, and service. And now before the benediction, I just want to remind you, uh, we'll be having our membership meeting over in Geneva Hall through the Narthex over there. And then we have our fellowship time, and the kids are going to be doing some practicing. Uh, but our fellowship time is over in the CE building across the parking lot over here. And now, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness. May he protect you through all of life's storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing into our doors once again. Amen. Amen. Let's lift our voices up in singing, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Thank you.